Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I can see our number of participants at the bottom of the screen uh, ratcheting up, and I am pleased to announce uh, the start of our Reverse Inquiries Workshop set Series in-depth session, Repack Programs, Structuring and Legal Considerations. I am joined today uh, by two of my colleagues, uh, Jerry Marlat and Anna Pinedo. Uh, Jerry is a partner based in New York. Uh, Jerry represents issuers, underwriters, and placement entities in public and private offerings of benchmark debt, covered bonds, bank capital notes, surplus notes, securities of structured investments, and specialized operating companies, and securities repackagings. Um, and Anna Pinedo, our partner also based in New York. Anna concentrates her practice on securities and derivatives. She represents issuers, investment banks, financial intermediaries, and investors in financing transactions, including IPOs and private placements of equity and debt securities, as well as structured notes and other hybrid structured products. In the derivatives area, she counsels several major financial institutions acting as Dealer and dealers and participants in the commodities and derivatives markets, and she advises on structuring issues and on regulatory issues, including those arising under the Dodd-Frank Act. And I am Ed Parker. I am a partner based in London. I'm the global head of our derivatives and structured products practice, and I cover all aspects of derivatives, um, OTC, structured credit, equity, FX, and commodity derivatives, and repackagings. And as part of our agenda today, we are going to focus on compartment or repack vehicles in Europe. Uh, we will be looking at European uh, and US risk retention requirements and capital relief transactions. We will be looking at the US structures and also um, emissions certificates repackagings. So I'm going to kick off with a discussion of the repack vehicles and structures in Europe. Um, I've, um, I've been working on uh, repackaging transactions uh, since I first started in the city in 1997. Uh, and during that time, rep repackagings have been on a bit of a, a roller coaster. So 25 years ago or so, um, there were a number of programs that were active in the city. Uh, there were, um, and they were very much structured as MTN programs. So very much uh, what you'd see for uh, an, an MTN issuance, albeit you'd have a, an S SPV uh, and you would have a, a trust deed, uh, an agency, um, a agency agreement, very much standalone documentation package. And each time a new repackaging vehicle was created, uh, then there would be a new set of documentation that was put in place. About um, three to four years later, the documentation started to become streamlined. And what we would see would is every time a new SP, uh, a particular um, arranging bank had had it, uh, had started a repackaging program, uh, they would um, establish a new uh, repack vehicle. It could be in Luxembourg, Ireland, Netherlands, other jurisdictions. And it would have an offering document, but then for each individual issuance, there would be a trust instrument which incorporated various modules, standalone modules, such as an agency module, a trust module, or similar. And this allowed one set of documentation to be prepared for um, each um, fi finance institution. And then each time a um, repackaging program was set up, it could piggyback off the same set of standard documents. Now, the repackaging programs started to be initially were just used for asset repackaging, so repackagings of bonds and loans. They then started to be used for credit link, uh, credit link notes, uh, particularly arbitrage transactions. And they really uh, rode off the back of the uh, synthetic CDO revolution. So suddenly we, we had not just single name CDSs, then there were portfolio S CDSs, then we had CDO squares, CDO cubes, really very complex instruments and that all blew up with the financial crisis and issuance fell off a cliff 
and then gradually it started to pick up again and much of that was due to um, regulatory capital uh, ish, ish, um, arrangements as well. But one of the big revolutions we saw when we we're looking at the European structures was the creation of the SPIRE program in 2016. So we've talked about how we moved from having MTN style documents to each individual um, bank that was arranging programs having its own set of documentation and modules, what the Spire program did was it created a central platform for the issuance of uh, re repackagings. So Spire is a special purpose vehicle. It's established in Luxembourg and it issues securities on a limited recourse basis. This is something that runs right through the, the, the history of repackaging programs. And a lot of the major institutions have signed up for it. I think it's about 16 at the moment. But you can see on the screen some of the institutions that have signed up to the SPIRE program and they use it. So HSBC, City, BNP Paribas, NatWest, JP Morgan, Unicredit, Goldman Sachs, Santander, Sockgen, and, and there's several others uh, as well. And so the idea here, and you can see all of the documentation for SPIRE, it's all online, it's on SPIRE's website. And the idea is that any institution can accede to this program. It takes advantage of this compartment documentation and it can issue repackaged securities. And so when you look at the overall volumes of repackaging, a lot of it is coming through this SPIRE program. So how does it work? Here is uh, the, SP the SPIRE structure. This is um, uh, an excerpt from the SPIRE program. And you can see in the, the, the pink square in the middle is SPIRE, the single platform investment repackaging entity as its, uh, its full name is, uh, as the issuer. The issuer will issue securities to note holders and the proceeds of those notes will be invested in collateral. Um, if that's just a straight rep repackaging, uh, the, uh, or if there's a credit linked note element, there will be a CDS with a swap counterparty. In any event, there will be a swap as well to reprofile payments on the underlying collateral, which is the return that's provided to the note holders. We have a trustee that will take security for the note holders over the uh, rights of the issuer under the swap and the rights to the collateral. Any of the collateral, which will comprise both cash that's invested in the notes and any securities which are invested in will be held by a custodian. We'll have an issuer and paying agent who will, will take care of, of the payments. If they're registered securities, we have a registrar. We have a calculation agent. We have a disposal agent for realizing the collateral. So these are the parties to our SPIRE structure. And our great advantage is the standardization of documentation that accompanies that. So this captures a huge part of the repackaging market in Europe. Um, moving to our next slide. Um, how um, bespoke repackaging programs. So apart from Spire, so, uh, we do have a number of bespoke repackaging programs. These are institutions who arrange these who have not signed up to Spires or perhaps have their own bespoke arrangements for particular types of underlying. These are structured in a similar way. So SPVs will be established in tax-friendly jurisdictions. So these are ones where they'll, any ta tax will impo be imposed on the profit spread, not on, on revenues in jurisdictions which have uh, the right tax treaties in place where the note holders are as, as well. Um, and we'll have corporate administrators and similar in, um, infrastructure to set up an SPV and also have the benefit of a securitization law to allow for limited recourse issuance. And the popular ones, the jurisdiction in Europe these days are Ireland, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. You do sometimes see these in uh, places like uh, the Channel Islands as well, but certainly for repacks, these are the three most common jurisdictions. Structure is broadly similar to Spires. Uh, what we have, uh, we have an offering document, uh, which uh, will look like any other offering document in terms of disclosure, having the terms and conditions of the individual notes. Then for each program, 
the general way this is done is there will be a program deed which is signed by all of the parties and this will incorporate standard form modules so a, a trust module which is where we have um, security being taken over the underlying assets an agency module for the um, uh, terms of, uh, uh, of the issue and paying agency, a swaps module which sets out um, uh, an ISDA master agreement and, and schedule, and a collateral sale module as, as well. Now these modules are incorporated into the program deed and signed program establishment. And then for each individual limited recourse issuance, we will have a series deed, which constitutes the individual series of notes and makes any changes to these modules specific to the specific issue and a pricing supplement as a supplemental offering document. Um, so that's um, that will take care of the section of the market that's uh, repackaging more bespoke assets and for uh, arranging institutions who are not a party to spires. Now, one of the um, drivers, uh, as I move to my next slide uh, for, for, for this, um, is um, the ca capital requirements. And um, actually, just as a, an aside here, the parties to these bespoke repackaging transactions are similar to what we have for spires, so trustees and paying agents, counterparties, custodians, and, and administrators. But um, the capital requirements uh, element of uh, 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 of these transactions is a big change from the early days of what we saw in repackagings, which tended to be arbitrage transactions. Now, a common driver for repackaging transactions is getting a better capital uh, treatment for the arranging institution. So, as an example, if you had uh, a, a bank it has a number of loans on its books, it could enter into a, a total return swap or a CDS on those loans with a special purpose vehicle and with the idea that it maintains those loans on its uh, on its books and records but it obtains capital relief on those so just moving across to my next slide um here's a, a snapshot of uh the ball capital framework in in europe and as we move through the bank capital framework and the capital requirements as how they rate to credit risk, what we're looking at is homing in on the provisions for credit risk mitigation, which are divided into funded credit risk mitigation and unfunded credit risk mitigation. What we're looking at here is funded credit risk mitigation as it's set out under the capital requirements regulation, which is, called, uh, which is CRR in Europe, and one of the permitted credit risk mitigants for funded credit risk mitigation is the use of credit linked notes. So just moving to my next uh, slide here, uh, there's many ways to do this, uh, but um, uh, Here's an example of a synthetic securitization, sometimes what these vehicles are now used for. If we have the SPV issuer, this is operating very much in the same way as our early repack example. Proceeds paid to SPV issuer, proceeds seeds are held in a collateral account. And what we could have here is this mezzanine tranche is what's being issued out to note holders with a retained tranches in a portfolio falling a part of a capital restructure. And this whole repackaging arrangement uh, uh, acting as a synthetic securitization, which allows the uh, arranging institution to get capital relief on the underlying asset. Now, often uh, what we see for in pure repackagings is instead of that being a portfolio, like in this example, we'll have a single loan or a one or two loans that are sitting in this portfolio. We have a, a guarantee or CDS which entered into with the, the, the SP, SPV issuer. Uh, and it's through this arrangement that the capital benefit is obtained for the arranging institution. So just moving on to my next, onto the next slide here, that will go through. Um, and you can see that this um, uh, is all based on CRR. We've got a couple of excerpts from here to define what synthetic securitizations are, what the eligible types of credit derivatives are for capital relief. And you can see Article 204, we've got credit linked notes being a form of credit risk mitigant. And of course, these credit linked notes are can be issued through a repackaging 
program. So with that, um, I will pass across to Jerry uh, to discuss US structures. Jerry, over to you. Thank you, Ed. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So this is a, a, a diagram of a sample repackaging um, just to illustrate the, the um, um, transfer of the assets, the swaps, um, and uh, the mechanics of, of, um, of payments. In U.S. repackagings, often we use trusts. It's um, usually a, or often a, a Delaware master trust. Uh, there are, however, several structuring concerns in using a trust for repackaging in the U.S. First, the trust is usually a passive vehicle, so there's no active management of the, of the assets of the trust. And secondly, often there's a concern that the trust will be an investment company under the Investment Company Act of 1940. Under a master trust, each of the series of the trust will constitute a, a separate legal entity for most purposes. And the assets of each series of the trust generally are segregated from the assets of each other series, although there will be some bankruptcy concerns. Master trusts are usually established as bankruptcy remote vehicles. Next slide, please. Most of the repackaging in the US are done on a private basis. And the reason being that under um, Reg AB and under um, um, Rule 190, the limitations on repackaging for registered offerings are usually um, difficult and complex, and it's easier to do these as private placements. For most structures, consideration should be given to the Investment Company Act and to the um, to risk retention requirements. There are commodity pool considerations, which Anna is going to talk about later, vocal rule issues, and accounting consolidation issues. So what's the problem with the Investment Company Act? The difficulty is that an entity registered under the Investment Company Act is subject to numerous restrictions, particularly restrictions on its capital structure. It's subject to the regulatory scheme of the Investment Company Act, both on reporting and filing obligations. There are limits on its ability to transact with affiliates, sponsors or depositors, for example. Um, an affiliate that underwrites offerings to an investment company is also subject to restrictions. As I said, there are restrictions on the capital structure, so on the issuance of debt. And an investment company has to satisfy asset coverage tests. So an investment company is defined as an issuer that is or holds itself out as being engaged primarily in the business of investing, reinvesting, or trading in securities or it is engaged in the business of issuing face amount certificates of the installment type, or is engaged in the business of investing, reinvesting, owning, holding, or trading in securities, and the, the securities constitute at least 40% of its assets. Next slide, please. So there's several exemptions from the Investment Company Act registration requirements that are used in repackagings. The first one is um, section 3C1. So section 3C1 exempts a company from the definition of an investment company if it has less than 100 holders, excluding its short-term paper. Another exemption is section 3C7 that exempts an entity from the definition if it excuse me, if its securities are owned only by qualified purchasers and it's not making a public offering. And finally, a common exemption under the Investment Company Act is Rule 3A7, which was designed primarily for asset-backed securities issuers. And any issuer engaged in the business of um, of acquiring and holding eligible assets and who does not issue redeemable securities will not be deemed an investment company 
as a result of Rule 3A7. And redeemable securities are securities uh, defined in Section 2A32 as any security other than short-term paper under the terms of which the holder is entitled to its proportional share of the issuer's current net assets or the cash equivalent thereof. There are a number of conditions for compliance with Rule 3A7. First, the issuer has to issue fixed income securities or other securities that entitle the holders to receive payments that depend on the cash flows of the eligible assets. The securities sold must be rated investment grade, except for securities that are sold to qualified institutional buyers and institutional accredited investors. And there cannot be any active management of the assets in response to market movements, so that acquisition and disposition of assets may only be made in accordance with the governing documents and may not trigger a downgrade of the issuer's ratings. And there must be a trustee uh, to hold a perfected security interest in the assets. Next slide, please. The definition of eligible assets under the under Rule 387 is similar to the definition of eligible, uh, excuse me, the definition of ABS under, under regulation AB. Financial assets are either fixed or revolving assets that by their terms convert into cash within a finite period of time, plus any other rights or other assets designed to assure the distribution of proceeds, particularly servicing rights and, and, and similar rights. It is possible that a series can be backed by eligible assets. Certain series can be backed by eligible assets while other series will be backed by assets that are not eligible assets in repackaging. So equities, mutual fund shares, et cetera. Next slide, please. So most repackagings are securitizations under, under US law and involve the issuance of asset-backed securities, which exposes us to a risk retention requirement. Um, part 246, under the, the federal securities law. It is possible that certain series of the trust may not involve the issuance of asset-backed securities and therefore would not be subject to the risk retention requirements. Um, sometimes it's reasonable to take the view that secured notes issued by a repack entity are not asset-backed securities because they're not collateralized by self-liquidating assets and payments don't depend primarily on the cash flows from those assets. For repack notes, to the extent the assets consist of equities, mutual fund shares or hedge fund shares or similar assets, those would not be asset-backed securities. However, other series that constitute, excuse me, that have as assets bonds, or ABS, for example, would constitute asset-backed securities, and the risk retention requirement would apply to those uh, to those series. Next slide, please. It's worth noting that in 2016, um, a CDI was issued by the staff that took the view that if the only asset held by the SPV is an obligation of the sponsor and the payments on the notes issued by the SV, SPV replicate the payments on the obligation, and the obligation is a direct obligation of the sponsor, the staff would look through those notes and look through to the balance sheet of the sponsor to make payments on the notes and would conclude, therefore, that the notes are not asset-backed securities. On the other hand, if the sponsor is directly obligated on the notes through a guarantee or a similar arrangement, the sponsor would be effectively holding 100% credit risk on the issued notes and be in compliance with the risk retention requirement. So the risk retention requirement applies both to publicly issued and privately issued notes because the rule re, uh, applies to asset-backed securities as defined in Section 3A79 of the Act. The issuance of asset-backed securities, for example, under Rule 144A 
would require a 5% risk retention to be held by the sponsor or wholly owned affiliate. The 5% requirement it was established under the Dodd-Frank Act in, in 2010. The required retained interest can be satisfied in two ways, either by holding a vertical interest, that is 5% uh, of each class of assets that's issued, or an eligible horizontal interest, or by a combination of the two. And the horizontal interest would be the most subordinated class or classes representing the required percentage of the fair value of the ABS interest to be issued. As I said, the retained interest has to be held by the sponsor or by a majority owned affiliate. Next slide, please. The rule generally prohibits a sponsor or the holder of the, of the retained interest from selling or transferring the retained interest or pledging it as collateral to support another obligation unless the obligation is a full recourse obligation to the pledging entity. And certain hedging activities are permissible, um, interest rate hedges, for example. With that, I will turn it over to Anna for the commodity pool discussion. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, I would just say, um, and we probably should have said this at the outset, um, and I think it's it's clear from the diagram that Ed showed and, and Sherry from the diagram that you showed um, that these are complex transactions uh, that um, they can vary a great deal. Um, and uh, just as, uh, as Ed um, showed in his diagram, um, in Europe, they tend to be compartment vehicles, um, as you showed in, in your vehicle when we do them in the US, they're master trusts. Um, in the US, we also work on these when um, we do compartment structures. So um, for sales into the US, the Luxembourg, um, entity um, or an Irish entity or a Netherlands entity. Um, and um, we analyze each of these issues on a compartment by compartment basis. And the analysis can differ on a compartment by compartment basis, depending on um, the facts and circumstances that Jerry was talking about. And the analysis can be different um, compartment by compartment or series by series, depending on the structure. Um, and each of these, um, the analyses for, for each of these, the, um, the 40 Act, uh, the risk retention, and what I'm going to talk about, uh, the CPO, um, CTA issues, Volcker, all of it um, is very fact specific. So our comments today are um, general and are intended um, to provide a, a general sense of um, some of the structuring considerations for all of these, which are um, interesting and and can be a whole lot of fun. Um, and as Ed said, have um, cycled back um, in the US, um, a lot of the interest in these has um, increased in some measure um, for some of the same reasons um, that they have in, uh, in Europe. So Ed mentioned, um, the um, credit risk transfers, so some of these are done in the U.S. Um, for um, those reasons. Some of these are done in the U.S. Um, for very different reasons. Um, in Jerry's um, structure, if you flip the page back to it, um, you'll see that um, they also can be done um, to synthetically rep uh, replicate the returns uh, or the return profile of a structured product um, or to provide exposure, indirect exposure um, to an asset, uh, a mutual fund, a fund product um, that may um, be difficult to access directly for a certain type of investor. So there are a myriad of reasons why one may want to do it. Um, one may want to provide um, this investment through a repack. So um, getting into um, commodity pool issues. 
again, may seem like an esoteric area, but something that you need to worry about if um, your repack or a compartment of the repack is going to include a swap. Um, so commodity pool used to be a relatively narrow um, definition. Um, in um, 2010, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act amended the definition in the Commodity Exchange Act of commodity pool. Um, so the CFTC considers um, any investment trust um, syndicate or similar form of enterprise um, that trades a commodity interest to be a commodity pool. Uh, a commodity pool really is any pooled um, vehicle. So um, when Jerry was talking about um, these vehicles as being trust or passive investment vehicles, they instinctively um, raise commodity pool issues that you have to be on the lookout for. And unfortunately, the case law um, in this respect is bad in the sense that you could have a single swap and potentially um, be viewed as a commodity pool. Um, so if we go to the next um, slide, um, the CFTC also has pretty broad latitude, um, and the CFTC has been fairly um, aggressive in, in recent years from an enforcement perspective. So it has pretty broad latitude to take um, a view that it can include within the term commodity pool um, certain vehicles. So why is it bad um, to be a commodity pool? We'll go to the next slide. Um, commodity pools and commodity pool operators. So an entity, the sponsor or the depositor of one of these repacks, if the repack is the commodity pool, would be the commodity pool operator. A commodity pool um, is subject to, um, to regulation by a number of different regulators, not just one. Um, it's subject to um, regulation by uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC, uh, by the National Futures Association, which kind of performs the same function that FINRA performs for the SEC, but for the CFTC, potentially by a futures exchange, and of course, enforcement um, by the DOJ if you've um, done something wrong. And the CFTC um, has um, regulates the activities of market participants, and that would include the CPO and the commodity pool operator. Um, and the NFA um, would have jurisdiction over um, the activities of CPOs. And CPOs face uh, a fair bit of scrutiny regarding how um, they promote their activities. So advertising restrictions, um, restrictions on the types of materials that they can use, um, restrictions on the types of persons that they can um, solicit, uh, restrictions regarding um, the uh, types of performance data that they can use. Um, a CPO has to register with the CFTC. Um, its associated persons have to be NFA members. Um, so generally something to be avoided if one can avoid it. If we go to the next slide, um, in addition to um, the CPO issue, there is also potentially the CTA issue. So a commodity trading advisor um, is a person who um, comparable to an investment advisor who's being compensated um, for advice um, in connection with um, commodity pool <laughs> functionally um, advising in connection with um, contracts of sale for commodities. So again, the depositor, the sponsor might also be viewed as a CTA. So if we go to the next slide, we look to a number of, and, and the next one, we look to a number of available exemptions from CPO registration. Um, we can look at these on a pool by pool basis, as I mentioned, so compartment by compartment basis. So there's the de minimis rule um, for uh, 13. So um, to claim uh, the exemption, you see the requirements, and these have to be met at all times. Um, so either uh, of the following 
two tests with regard to the particular pool. So that's one that is commonly relied on um, in order for um, a particular uh, compartment of a repack to be exempt from CPO registration. We'll go on to the next slide. In addition to meeting the test, you would have to ensure that you're only selling to accredited investors. Generally, sales for um, these would only be made to institutional accredited and to quibs. Um, Jerry talked about 387 in any event. Um, so uh, you probably would only be selling um, to a limited class anyway. Um, so that wouldn't impact your CPO exemption. And you would have to file a claim uh, for reliance on the exemption. We go to the next slide. There have been several amendments um, in the last couple of years. So <clears throat> you can now, as a non-US CPO, so if you're a foreign bank, let's say, or you're a foreign compartment vehicle, um, you can uh, rely on exemptive relief um, for um, certain repack vehicles, even if you serve as a CPO um, to other pools where US persons are invested. This is particularly useful. Um, you can also um, rely on a safe harbor and um, limit uh, your activities to non-US persons and rely on that as an exemption um, from CPO registration. So this has provided a fair bit more certainty in the CPO world. Volker, um, as Jerry said, oftentimes um, repack structures uh, raise Volcker issues um, because the sponsors of many of these repack vehicles are um, banking entities. So um, a banking entity uh, is uh, any U.S. insured depository institution, a parent company of a U.S. insured depository institution, a company that's treated as a bank holding company um, for purposes of Section 8 of the International Banking Act um, or an affiliate or subsidiary of any of the um, entities that I mentioned um, in any of those categories. So um, in all likelihood, um, the sponsor um, will know if it needs to consider um, Volcker as a factor in um, connection with being a sponsor or a depositor of a repack vehicle. And this will come into play um, if it is going to own um, any kind or have any kind of ownership interest. Again, this is gonna come into play because um, the repack vehicle is going to be a passive entity, so uh, and may be viewed as a covered fund. So we go back to the area that Jerry was covering. Um, what 40 Act or which 40 Act exemption is going to be relied upon um, in the United States if we're looking at um, a vehicle that is um, operating in the United States and that is focused on the 40 Act. So is it relying on 3C1, the fewer than 100 persons? Is it relying on 3C7, um, the qualified um, purchaser? Um, so is it relying on one of those exclusions um, from the definition of covered fund? Next slide. Um, is it relying on one of um, the securitization exclusions um, that are generally available to securitization type entities, or is it going to rely on one of uh, the newer uh, exemptions um, that are available based on the 2019 revisions to the Volcker rule um, that create um, some additional uh, possibilities for entities for activities that are customer accommodation activities, 
um, or um, similar uh, exemptions. So very important to understand the interplay between the 40 Act uh, exemption if it's an entity that's focused on um, transacting in the United States and isn't um, solely uh, outside of the United States and um, the Volcker exemption. We'll go to the next slide. Um, if it is uh, a wholly owned subsidiary, then there are other issues. Um, Jerry mentioned at the outset accounting issues. So oftentimes, and in the diagram that Jerry showed, um, there's usually a request on the part of the client to have um, the repack vehicle not be consolidated and essentially not be a wholly owned subsidiary and not be on balance sheet um, with um, the sponsor or the depositor. If it's a wholly owned subsidiary, that introduces a whole other set of issues for um, Volcker purposes, um, as well as um, for Bank Holding Company Act purposes. We'll go on to the next slide. Um, then there's determining whether there's an actual ownership interest. So does the depositor or sponsor of the repack vehicle actually own uh, an interest that would qualify as an ownership interest for Volcker purposes in the repack vehicle? And so all of these are issues to consider. Um, next slide. Um, we have... Uh, the definition of ownership interest for Volcker, again, going to be a highly fact specific inquiry in the context of how um, these entities are, are structured. So I'm not going to um, dive into the details. And then last but not least, I do want to get to the accounting issues. So maybe we'll go there before I turn it back to um, Ed, so he has a little bit of time to go um, focus on some of the ESG issues that clients are asking about. So from an accounting perspective, as I mentioned, um, a number of complicated issues that are a mix of legal questions as well as accounting questions. So the objective usually is to avoid consolidation. And one generally does that um, by establishing the entity as an orphan. So having the equity interest held by a third party, by multiple um, third parties, um, so that uh, the sponsor, the depositor is not the principal beneficiary of the variable interest entity. Um, still, if you go back to the diagram that Jerry um, sent, it's always going to be a little bit um, tricky to navigate all of this. Um, Jerry also talked about risk retention and um, the relief that's provided by the SEC staff in the compliance and disclosure interpretations. Um, and um, in Jerry's diagram, um, there was a structure that contemplated various swaps as well as a structure that contemplated having a guarantor. So if you have a sp sponsor that is a swap counterparty and a guarantor, or a guarantor, I should say, it's going to be increasingly difficult to argue for deconsolidation. Um, but if you do have a swap guarantor, uh, a, a swap counterparty, um, or a guarantor role, then um, that does make uh, the argument relating to risk, uh, to not needing risk retention a whole lot easier. So it's always going to be a little bit of a balancing act in terms of these various conflicting um, conflicting priorities um, when structuring. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed to talk about um, emissions certificates repackagings, um, which has been garnering a lot of interest. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, um, when in, in my earlier part of the, the talk, uh, we looked at the SPIRE program and, and one of the issues there is why wouldn't everybody 
use this SPIRE program that so many institutions have acceded to. And I mentioned that um, it's still very popular to set up bespoke repackaging programs for more unusual underlying assets. So they could be particular types of loans, for example. But one of the areas we have seen new programs coming uh, into the fore is the repackaging of the unusual underlying asset of emissions certificates. So whereas uh, most of the repackagings we've talked about, they're repackaging debt instruments, uh, that would be bonds, it could be loans, or it could be looking at doing credit linked notes. Well, with uh, emissions, repackaging emissions certificates, uh, there's an extra need for an understanding of the underlying asset. So we've got some detail in these slides for you uh, because we're circulating to, the, to them to you and it, I would recommend having a, a read through these. Um, there is a, a US emissions trading market in the United States, of course. It's more established and particularly more established for repackaging uh, arrangements in, in Europe. But um, emissions uh, certificates are a regulatory creation. Uh, it all stems from the Kyoto Protocol and one of the mechanisms used for uh, reducing the amount of greenhouse gases has been to uh, establish emissions trading cap and trade schemes. So these work and uh, there, there's a scheme in California, there's various ones in the US, uh, but the big two big ones we have in Europe are the EU ETS and the UK uh, ETS. And for all designated uh, polluting institutions, um, they have to uh, submit a um, a, a permit for um, uh, for every ton of polluting gas uh, that that they pr they produce. Now, because these uh, permits are tradable, and the idea is to create a tradable market, uh, this is something that can then be be uh, be repackaged. So, at the end of each year, the polluting institution has to submit a certificate, either that uh, that that it ha it already has, or which has been brought bought in the market. Um, um, to to, uh, to a registry. Now, certain registries uh, allow entities which have not uh, not polluting entities, but could just be trading entities, to buy and trade certificates. So, if we could just uh, just turning to the next slide, this is um, a, a scheme that has increased over time since 2005, through uh, through through to what we have currently, with an idea that the number of permits in the market decrease on a linear basis. Now. Interestingly, this was a scheme that was pioneered first in the UK and was then rolled out across Europe. Now, since we've had Brexit and the UK separating itself from the, the EU, we now have our own separate scheme in Europe, a UK emissions trading scheme, which is for all purposes exactly the same as the EU scheme. So what we're seeing is there's some arbitrage between certificates in the UK and EU, uh, but also it's a, it's a popular uh, asset class. So if I move across to my next screen slide, um, and I'll move across onto my next one after that. Um, where these assets are being repackaged, our structure looks very much like the structure I showed earlier for um, bespoke repackaging programs. So an SPV established in Luxembourg, Ireland, or the Netherlands, it issues notes, the proceeds of those notes are instead used to invest in emissions certificates. Now, there are a number of things to bear in mind when repackaging emissions certificates due to the specific legal and regulatory nature of these. So what I've done is, um, for those on the call who might be considering uh, working in this area, I've flagged up a few of the key points to consider. Uh, the first of these is, as I've mentioned, not uh, that um, we have registries in each of the EU 27 countries, the same in the UK. Now, only certain of those registries allow entities who are not trading entities, so i.e. not the glass manufacturers or the car manufacturers, but trading entities to open an account with a client registry. Now, the most popular ones are Ireland, Luxembourg and the Netherlands, but most of the other ones don't allow effectively an SPV or, or a, a, a custodian entity to, to enter an account. So one of our, our first, uh, first issues is, can an SPV actually enter an account, uh, open an account to trade these certificates? On my next slide, here are some of my other key issues. Can you take security 
over these emissions allowances. So as a given in the earlier structures, what do the, the, the note holders buy the notes? Security is taken over the collateral. Should there be a default on the collateral, then the trustee will go in and sell the collateral and force the security. Now, the trouble with emission certificates is not all jurisdictions allow you to take security over emissions allowances. In fact, one of the popular jurisdictions, the Netherlands, specifically says in its law, you cannot take security over the underlying assets. You can, though, do this in Luxembourg. So if you can't take security, you have to look at are there quasi security structures, such as creating a, a special type of SPV to directly hold the assets uh, called a, a Stichting that we've seen as a popular setup in, in, in the Netherlands. Another issue is if you have a custodian who's holding these securities and you have an omnibus account, well, in the normal course, if your custodian went bust, you'd look for client asset rules to see if you could take back individual securities that were mixed with with others in an omnibus account. Well, one of the problems with emission certificates is they're not classified as financial instruments under the particular regulatory regime. So you've got to look very carefully at what would happen if your custodian became bust who's holding these assets. Would they be treated as client assets? How would you go in? How would you get these? So this is a particular point of, of concern. Another piece is often uh, there's been talk for some time that the European Commission, who the, regulates these products, is going to get tough on position limits. So making sure that no particular institutional entity holds more than a certain amount of the positions in the trading market. Now, the trades that we see in emissions re as certificates repackages tend to be really big. They're often sort of 500 million or so. And these particular entries, yes, these are done on a limited recourse basis, but they're still done through the same SPV. So before you know it, you can add up to several billion of emission certificates being held by the same SPV, which could start to come on the radar should there be position limits. So looking to make sure you've built in structures to deal with that. Um, so final thought as to you know, why would you do this? Well, as the, re the repack no, um, certificates start to become more scarce over time, um, this can drive up the value of the underlying securities, which uh, means we can have a cash and, and carry trade that certificates are held for a one or two year period and then delivered into a futures contract. So from this being something of a niche area when we first started working on these two to three years ago, that we're now seeing at least eight or nine investment banks in London getting involved in repackaging of uh, emissions certificates. We think it's going to, depending on, on the curve uh, and you know, how, what future pricing is seen, where it has all the hallmarks of something that we could become a much bigger area. Uh, of course, we've seen this before over the last 17, 18 years since they were created. After the financial crisis, the bottom dropped out of the market for some years. But given that the regulatory direction is to have ever fewer of these certificates uh, in order to uh, drive up their value, there, there is um, a lot of scope for this being a new and uh, continually proper, uh, 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 um, popular asset for repackagings. So with that, uh, that brings us to the end of our talk. You'll see that we've also got some uh, uh, li links up on the screen if you'd like to take a look at our long and short blog uh, that covers interesting things on derivatives and our ESG uh, blog as well, uh, which is full of great materials. Uh, and with that, we would all like to say thank you, and you may all now disconnect. <laughs>